1963, the March on Washington. 1967, the Summer of Love. 1969, Woodstock. We remember the 60s as a time where everyone was so full of feelings of peace and love. It was a time of grooviness and social progress. Right? Nineteen sixty five, the Watts riots. Nineteen sixty seven, the Newark riots, the Plainfield riots, the Twelfth Street riots, and the long hot summer. Nineteen sixty eight, the Chicago DNC riot. Nineteen sixty nine, Richard Nixon becomes the President of the United States, and on his lips are the words law and order. When we think of the sixties, we forget that it was a period of significant internal strife. The world was changing rapidly, and whenever the world changes, there are always those trying to force a backlash. Social progress was being achieved, segregation was coming to an end, and it looks like black people might finally have the chance to make some social progress. But that, of course, was unacceptable to many. And so came Barry Goldwater, and George Wallace, and Richard Nixon, and the mantra of law and order. Law and order has long been a way to attack groups that threaten the status quo in America. Anyone who is a threat to the established power structures must also be a threat to law and order. And since the 20th century, it's especially come to represent the perpetuation of racial oppression. Today we're going to look back in the history, and we're going to find out how law and order became a mantra of oppression and a dog whistle. I'm Ian Stevens, and you're watching The Lucretia Report. The use of the phrase law and order in America goes back a lot further than most people realize it does, at least as far back as the 1840s. And it's been used not just to suppress calls for civil rights, but also to suppress calls for voting rights, economic freedom, the right to organize labor, and more. Whenever it's arisen, it's been because there was some force bubbling up that wanted to change the way that America works. And there were people in power who benefited from the status quo, specifically people who benefited from the oppression, who wanted to stop that change. Status quos are a hard thing to change. and. Oftentimes, when people are trying to stop that change, they decide that their best bet is obstinance. They'll refuse to take any steps towards reform or to work with the reformers, and pretty soon the oppressed start to feel like their efforts are just running into a brick wall. The longer that goes on, the more and more it will feel like the only option is direct action, and there will be unrest eventually. Probably the earliest use of this term in American politics was the Law and Order Party of Rhode Island, which was formed in 1842 in response to the Door Rebellion. By the 1840s, Rhode Island was still operating under the same constitution that they had had since 1663, when it was originally established as a colony, and this constitution said that only men who owned more than $134 worth of land, a bit over $4,000 in today's money, could vote. As the Northeastern United States industrialized, more and more people came to live in cities, not owning land. And by the early 1840s, 60% of the men in Rhode Island were disenfranchised. Activists tried for years to change the state's charter, but the legislature was made up of wealthy rural landowners, elected by wealthy rural landowners, and well, that doesn't much sound like an institution that would have any interest in changing the system that gave them a monopoly on power, does it? In 1841, a group led by Thomas Wilson Dorr gave up on reform through the legislature and convened to write their own constitution. The governor was having none of this. He didn't entertain presenting the constitution to the legislature. He declared their assemblies illegal and he declared martial law. Pretty soon there was fighting breaking out between Dorr's men and the state militia. Dorr was defeated, but it was during this rebellion that Governor King created the Law and Order Coalition, which would soon grow into the Law and Order Party, painting Dorr as a lawless hooligan disturbing the peace of the state. 
During its short existence, the Law and Order Party would work to maintain the superiority of wealthy rural landowners and to oppose anything that would expand the right to vote. Jump forward to the latter parts of the Industrial Revolution and we see most Americans living in impoverished conditions with terrible working conditions. Most urban workers at this point were working long shifts with no oversight of safety or hygiene, performing dangerous and exhausting manual labor for very little pay. Workers had no agency on their own to press for shorter hours, higher pay, or better working conditions, and managers and owners had no incentive but to squeeze as much as they possibly could out of their workers for as little money as they could possibly do it for. So workers formed labor unions that would allow them to negotiate as a collective and have more bargaining power when negotiating with these managers and owners. They were powerless as individuals, but as a group they could push for change. And a lot of union activities at this time, like strikes or walkouts, had a very tense atmosphere because the owners and managers who didn't believe that union activity had any right to exist were trying any means necessary to bust the unions. A lot of these confrontations ended up getting violent, like when the Carnegie Steel Company hired mercenaries to shoot down strikers at their homestead mill, or at Haymarket Square in Chicago, where police shot at strikers and the next day someone responded by throwing a bomb at the police. This of course was ripe for a law and order narrative from the people who wanted to discredit the unions, and that was a common framing from anti-union sorts at that time. Listen here to where Calvin Coolidge, who would later go on to become the President of the United States, is using the law and order narrative in a way that feels like it could be straight out of the summer of 2020. There are present parties urging resistance to law in the name of freedom. Their works are evil. They know it. They must be resisted. Prosecution of the criminal and education of the ignorant are the remedy. Government must govern to obey his life, to disobey, his death. Any time the phrase was used up to this point, it was invariably to cast a social movement that was looking to upset the status quo as rabble-rousers. This is a convenient political narrative because it allows you to dismiss your opponents without actually addressing their concerns. Because of course our number one concern should be keeping the streets quiet. If we can cast these people as lawbreakers or disturbers of the peace, then surely their methods are wrong and they're not deserving of a place in civil, lawful debate. If we can malign their conduct, then we don't have to listen to them. We don't have to address their concerns. If we can malign them, then we can dismiss their cause. And this is especially true if we can convince people that these agitators, these anarchists, are putting them in danger with their reckless disregard of the status quo. Something that can make this especially appealing to the establishment is when they're trying to push back against something that is popular and for which there is no good argument against. You'll notice in the snippet of that Coolidge speech that I showed you earlier, he never actually says why unions as a concept are bad, and Governor King never really gives reasons why he thinks that 60% of the men in the states shouldn't be able to vote. Of course it is men, and I guess I should specifically say 60% of the white men, because it was the 1840s and so everyone in the state was pretty much in agreement that women and black people shouldn't be able to vote. Being against people being able to vote in a republic, or being in favor of capitalists exploiting their workers as much as they want to is a hard argument to make without you sounding like a royal prick. So it's much easier to just say that you're for law and order and against the agitators. In the modern day, the use of the phrase law and order has all of those same connotations, but some more also. It's almost invariably racially loaded, almost always a dog whistle used to push back against civil rights, and these modern law and order politicians came about in the 1960s. You probably hear people on the right sometimes throw out memes and facts where they'll tell you, you know, it's the Democratic Party that was the party of slavery and segregation. And that's absolutely true. Jefferson Davis and George Wallace and Andrew Johnson were all Democrats. And for a long time, at least in the South, the Democratic Party was largely the party of Jim Crow and the Republican Party was the party of black Southerners. Lyndon Johnson threw a wrench into those gears. 
This party structure first started to crack with FDR when his New Deal coalition brought a lot of people like black southerners and urban northerners into the Democratic Party who would have traditionally to that point voted for Republicans. This laid the groundwork for people like LBJ to be in the Democratic Party who, although a southern Democrat, was staunchly anti-segregation and pro-civil rights. In 1964, after seceding to the presidency upon the death of John Kennedy, LBJ ran for re-election and the electoral map looked like the inverse of what you would expect up to that point, with a solid South going to Republicans and everything else going to Democrats. When elections up to this point had looked like this, this was a shock to the system. This was the first time that Georgia had not voted for a Democrat since 1848, 116 years earlier, and before the Republican Party even existed. But why Republicans? The South traditionally hated Republicans, so why didn't they go to a third party that supported segregation like they did in 1848 when Democrat Harry Truman desegregated the military, or like they would just four years later in 1968 with George Wallace? Well, because of who the Republican was. Barry Goldwater, the senator from Arizona, is often credited with being the founder of modern American conservatism, and he's also often classed as the first modern law and order politician, at least at the national scale. Law and order and states' rights had been talking points in the South for a while at this point. The idea was that no matter what you think of segregation, it's up to the individual states to choose, and even if these civil rights activists have a good cause, they're agitators who are not respecting law and order. Does that sound familiar? But although these talking points existed, most southern politicians usually sounded more like George Wallace. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And that wasn't met with much success nationally, because outside of the Deep South, most people didn't want to think of themselves as racist, even if they were a lot of the time. Again, does that sound familiar? Barry Goldwater realized that Southern segregationists were becoming more and more disillusioned with the Democratic Party, and that if he capitalized on this coded language, that he could give a wink and a nudge to Southern racists, and Northern racists because those exist too, without alienating all the people who didn't want to think of themselves as racists. Lee Atwater, who would be a Republican strategist to presidents like Reagan and George H.W. Bush, and eventually the chairman of the RNC explained it pretty well in 1981. He, by the way, uses a word that I'm going to bleep, but it starts with an N and I think you know what it is. Here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a statistician or a political scientist, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract you handle the race thing. In other words, you start out, and you know, now y'all aren't quoting me, you start out in 1954 by saying By 1968, you can't say that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing, states rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, uh, that, that we're, we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. Uh, you follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying, uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. You know, I think I've used that audio before on this channel, but I can't remember where. I've made a lot of videos. I'll tell you what, if you can find it and comment the video, I'll pin your comment. Goldwater wasn't able to fully metastasize that strategy, but from 1964 to 1968 there would be a ton of urban riots and unrest like the ones I mentioned in the intro, and hundreds more which scared the daylight out of white suburbanites. Writing those news stories, Richard Nixon was able to push a law and order narrative that said to white suburbanites, don't worry, 
I, Richard Nixon, am here to protect you from the scary black people. This brought Nixon great success and he won that election in a landslide. After that, most people who won the presidency for a long time would use that same message. Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and after a short lapse with George W. Bush and Obama, Donald Trump. From there on though, instead of just being associated with unrest that threatens the status quo, this would invariably be associated with black people. Law and order doesn't mean law and order. It wasn't the response to the terrorist attacks by the white supremacist group The Order under Reagan or by the Army of God under Clinton. It wasn't the response to the Capitol insurrection that happened just a few weeks ago under Donald Trump. No, no. Law and order is reserved for the LA riots or Black Lives Matter. The reality is that law and order is just a catchphrase that people use when they don't want to admit that they hold an unpopular opinion and don't want to extend rights to oppress people. It's a last ditch effort to maintain the status quo when the popular will is turning against them. But it is last ditch. Because historically speaking, calls of law and order have always come when the status quo is faltering. And eventually the social change that law and order was putting off does in fact come. Rhode Island eventually expanded suffrage, labor laws were eventually introduced, segregation was eventually abolished, and soon this modern era of white supremacy too will come to an end. If you enjoyed that, be sure to go and like our Facebook page where we post all of our videos, our articles, breaking news, memes, and a whole lot more. You can go to facebook.com slash the Lucretia Report. Hey everybody, I hope that you enjoyed that. If you did, please be sure to give the video a like. You can watch another video here, and why not subscribe here? Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, links in the description. And special thanks to Rebecca S. and Mainly for their support on Patreon. Join them at patreon.com slash lucretiareport.